for all of you that are tuning in and are a part of this worship experience. On behalf of Overseer Apostle Eugene Shepherd, we want to welcome you into this fellowship and into this gathering. We always like to remind you that you are at a well, a well from which you can allow your, ve your vessels that are empty to be filled and or refilled. We pray that the word of God will arrive at your doorstep and treat you in a manner that is pleasing to the eyes of the Lord. Now let's go into the word of God as we take on a very uh, noteworthy topic that we have been dealing with over the past um, couple of sessions here. And I want us to continue and be reminded of what the word of God is saying for this season. Uh, we've been dealing with God's everlasting agreement, God's everlasting agreement. You know, God entered into a never ending agreement with Abraham. If you remember the story of Abraham, God entered into an agreement with him. And I'm always mindful and I always want to remind us about the covenant that God made with Abraham. Because I believe that it's from there that we're able to glean and we're able to see the revelation of what God is intended to do with mankind even today. Then we're going to look tonight, uh, we're going to look at Noah, we're going to go back into the book of Genesis. I love the book of Genesis, uh, the book of beginnings, because if we want to understand where God is going, we have to see where he has been. God entered into an unending agreement with David. We see the Daviatic covenant. We know about how God um, protected, he guided David. As a matter of fact, he called David a man after his own heart even when David fell short. So that becomes a precedent. If we know anything about the law, the law is built on precedent. Where one thing has been established, it sets and lays the foundation and the groundwork for what is to come next. Then with you and me, God has entered into an everlasting covenant. That's so awesome, isn't it? God has entered into an everlasting covenant. The covenant that will be perpetuated from generation to generation. I love the way the word of God is laid out so, so, so succinctly for us, for us to be able to see how God intends to migrate his people from one dimension to another. I want you to walk carefully with me. You're going to hear me talk about and deal with terms like agreement. You're going to hear me talk about covenant. You're going to hear me talk about promise assurances. You're going to hear me talk about a contract over the next couple of services and over the next couple of sessions, that is, we are going to be dealing with these terms as it relates to scripture and how they are to be applied. I shared with a friend of mine, always sharing and caring and receiving download that I believe in the practical application of scripture. While the revelatory expressions that are written in the word of God, the historical factors that are there for us to learn from, I believe in the practical application. Because to the end that God is going to use you and me to accomplish his will in the earth, the scriptures must be unfolded and practically applied. In our last session, we talked about God having entered into this never-ending agreement with Abraham. Isn't that right? We talked about how God, he promised Abraham certain things. And he promised them to not only to Abraham, but he promised them to his generations, to his seed, to his lineage. And I believe that you and I here today are part of that lineage of Abraham. So is whatever God promised Abraham, it flows through us to manifestation. We are also in, and it has been declared, that we're in a season of acceleration and a season of manifestation. Say that with me, please. A season of acceleration and a season of manifestation. Now, to the end that we will seek to explain what it means to have a season of acceleration and a season of manifestation, I'm going to put the two of them together. Accelerated manifestation. That whatever God has promised in his word, time is such that they're going to come about and they're going to come about suddenly. They're going to come about quickly. And because they're coming about quickly, we must be positioned always and postured to receive this spiritual download. 
Some people to ha- seem to have this idea about God that they compare how humans act and how humans respond to each other and think that God is going to respond the same way. No. What we will find oftentimes that we, if we put our trust in man, man will let us down. But when we put our trust in God, God cannot and nor will he ever let us down. And it is from that place and it is from that premise that I always want to teach and I always want to create a belief system so that I know that I'm standing firm on the word of God. I am always and we should always be looking for the manifested word of God. My Bible lets me know that these are the seasons where the sons of God will be standing up and will be manifested where in the earth. Every child of God should seek to stand firm on the foundation of the word of God. Let's look at how Paul takes it. It says, what do you have that you have not received? What is it that you can say that you have that you have not received? There is nothing that we have achieved in and of our own volition. Everything that exists, everything that we've received has been passed on. You might have thought that you earned it, but to the end that God is sovereign and he is complete and he is the creator and the creator of all things, there is nothing that we can claim to ourselves. The one thing that we can claim for ourselves is salvation. Because it is a free gift of God. Salvation is a free gift of God for which we are to receive. And guess where it's coming from? God. So there's no confusion about what is, has been established. So the covenant that God has established that we are living under and we are living in agreement with God has already come from God. We did not create this covenant. We did not create this agreement. Everything that we have come from God. And that can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We seem to always try to put ourselves and what we do as the main point. We always, human nature is braggadocious. We want to take credit for what God is doing sometimes. So therefore, we've got to sometimes be slapped back into the reality and say, where did that blessing come from? It came from God. And I should always give God credit because he is operating in the confines of the terms of the agreement that he established with Abraham. And we're going to go back and we're going to see some covenants laid out even before Abraham. Jesus is and should always be the main point. He obtained salvation for us. He is the finished work. He fulfills and has fulfilled the law on our behalf. Some people don't like to hear us preach like this, where we inject and interject ourselves in the equation. But to the end that God has saved us and he has made us an example, who then should we refer to? We should refer to God himself, yes, from whence it has come. But we are the subjects and the object of his affection. All that we need to do is to believe that all he has done is done it for us. He saved us. In that he saved us, he saved us from sin and saved us to himself. Think about it. He saved us from sin. But once we have been saved from something, what are we saved to? We have been saved unto God and God alone. So therein lies why we cannot take credit for our salvation. But we acknowledge the free gift that is salvation and live in accordance to the terms of the covenant that was made by God through Jesus Christ. I like to say that we don't save ourselves. Cannot, will not, ever, ever, never save ourselves. Jesus did it all for us. It is the finished work again. As we continue down the path of expressing what God is saying through this house, this will be what I'm going to call an amalgamated series of sermons. It's going to be an amalgamated series. It's going to be in a hodgepodge. It's going to be put together and fitly joined together. And you're going to see how God is going to use one element and bring light to the second portion of it. 
because we've been dealing with this everlasting agreement, the grace of God that brings us into a proper alignment calls for the people of God to be fruitful. That's one of the things that it does. The grace of God calls for us to be properly aligned. And in the word of God, it says, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. This is God's a part of God's everlasting agreement with mankind. Why are you saying that, Pastor Cliff? Because as we enter into the agreement with the word, there is a mandate to produce and reproduce in accordance to the kingdom mandate. Now, that's a lot of words, Pastor Cliff. I recognize that there is a lot of words being expressed here tonight. But to the end that God has commissioned and commanded us to be fruitful and he has established an agreement, we have to be fruitful and multiply and increase under the terms of the agreement. Because if we look to operate outside of the terms of the agreement, we're going to violate the very agreement that God has established. So there is no fruitfulness outside of God for a child of God. There is no reproduction outside of God for a child of God. Everything that we are, everything that we ultimately will be, has been shaped in the confines of the agreement that is established in the word. That's why if we can't produce, if you're having a life that is fruitless, you've got to go back to the terms of the agreement, like we're going back to the book of Genesis today, and seeing where is it that I'm operating outside of the conditions that has been established. I shared with a group on... This past um, Monday or Tuesday evening it was. Today is Wednesday, yes. This past uh, Monday. And what I shared with them was when the word of God came to me as a young man growing up in ministry, one of the words that came forth was that you were going to go into ministry. I heard it loud and clear. Then the other part of the word of God that came to me was that you're going to go into business. And it had been placed in me. So these were confirmations of the word of God that has been placed in my spirit for many, many years. So as we moved and we navigated and the word of God came real, the first thing that I needed to do was to act on the word of God because it was in the confines of the agreement that God had established for this child of God. So you know what I did? I went out and I pursued the word that came forth. The challenge that most Christians have today, they don't know how to pr pursue the word. The word is not running for us, from us, but we've got to pursue it. That means delve into the agreement that has been established between you and God so that the manifested blessings that can come forth so that you can be fruitful and multiply. So as time, and this was a very short amount of time that had gone by when the word of God came and says, you're going to go into business. You're going to go into ministry. I took the word literally. Anybody here ever taken the word of God literally? I pray that you have. I took the word literally and I ran toward the word. <clears throat> Pastor Eugene has shared some things with us down through time. And he says that this house was given a mandate some 20 some odd years ago that if the height and the depth and the reach of this ministry will grow to the heights of the sequoia trees. You all remember hearing that, right? Now, what does that mean? Bear with me. It means that there's a word that has gone forth. So now I've got to go and search the scripture. We've got to go and search the scripture as to what it means to reach a height of the sequoia trees. Where are the sequoia trees located? Where are the trees of Lebanon? What are the heights of the sequoia trees? Literally and figuratively. What are the dimensions of the sequoia trees? How deep does a sequoia tree go? So to the end that the word of God has been released, there is a requirement by every child of God to go out and search the word of God and apply the word of God every step of the way. And as time went on, the depth and the breadth 
The height of this ministry has been moving and systematically moving. And we have not reached the height of the sequoia tree yet because God is still revealing himself. I digress back to my own story. As the word of God came forth and said, you're going to go into business. The very next day, I went out and began to assemble the things that were necessary to go into business. So I didn't wait for the preacher to come and lay hands on me and say, yea, thus saith the Lord. Or I wait for me to have a dream or wait for somebody to come along and say, well, you need to move in this direction. I heard the word of God that says you're going to go. Go here becomes operative. It's the action word. Every time a child of God gets an action word, you need to act on it. That's what the agreement when, you know, uh, the, the creation was told, be fruitful and multiply. We talked about that before. What did creation have to do? Creation didn't ask any questions. Creation heard God and creation says, I am going to be fruitful and I'm going to multiply. They're not only saying it, now they're doing it. You will always be reminded that our salvation is not predicated on doing, but our blessings are predicated on doing and walking in obedience to the word of God. So as we moved and we navigated forward, we went into business. By the end of that revival, that series of services that was going on, we had been fully fledged in the business and producing revenue for the kingdom. If God can do that for me, I can assure you he can and will do that with you. So be fruitful and multiply creates the amalgamation that we're talking about here as it relates to God's everlasting agreement. Because his agreement here in the confines of the message that I have for us is that we must be fruitful and multiply. You remember the text. This is a part of the kingdom mandate. If you want to look at it with me, Genesis chapter 1 verse 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. We're not going to dwell on the good today. We're just going to go to the fact that God created great creatures and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. Saints and friends, this principle of multiplication applies to every area of our lives. When God said be fruitful and multiply, as we established in the previous session, we weren't dealing exclusively with procreation and having children. There's some 7 billion people on the earth. So I think we're doing a pretty good job of that element of it. But the church, the body of Christ, as large as we stand here today, is not producing at the level in which that we ought to produce. And who is the church? We are. That is always to be established that we are the church. So the principle of multiplication must be adopted by the church, by the body of Christ, so that we can be fruitful and multiply in the areas to which God has com commanded us to. And it continues down in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So now we have moved from creatures to mankind. And he created him male and female. He created them. He created male and female and told them to go and multiply. Let's look how he, he presents it. Then God blessed them and God said to them, now, if you're in business today, I'm commanding you and I'm instructing you to step forward. And the first thing you need to do every day is to bless your business. Pronounce a blessing on your day. The practical application here, the principles of the book of Genesis are here for us to learn. Sometimes we read it as a storybook, but it ought not to be read as a storybook. It needs to be read as life transforming interpretation of the agreement that's established by in, in the earth through God. 
He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So there are three distinct things, two occurring prior to the multiplication process and being fruitful. The first one, he blessed them. And then he spoke to them. How often have you heard to speak positively to the very thing that God has called you to, to walk into, to the agreement? Sometimes we walk and we cancel out the very blessing that God has released in our direction. I no longer want to participate in canceling out my own blessings. I want to participate in, in the exponential multiplication of the blessings of God. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Commands and instructions. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. We don't need to go back and reinvent and recreate the creation story. We are masters at that now. And if we are not masters at it, I've presented it in a very practical way that we ought to go back and read it, reread it until it comes alive. I always ask the question, what word has God given to you? What are the terms of the agreement that has been established on a personal level? There is a blanket agreement that has been given on the earth called salvation. But individually, God is commissioned and commanded us to be fruitful and multiply. Genesis chapter 8, let's read that, verse 15. Genesis chapter 8, verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, go out of the ark. You and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. We know the story of Noah. And we're going to go back and revisit it in a little bit more depth in a little while. But I want to move us forward in this eighth chapter because I want us to see the covenantal agreement that has been established by God between God and his children. Verse number 16, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. So now these are very specific instructions. God is a God of specificity. He's very specific. Verse 17, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, the birds and the cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Again, the specifics of the terms of the agreement that is established between God and Noah. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. He obeyed the command. Jump over to chapter 9, verse 1. Here's the promise. I told you that we're going to deal with the word promise. We're going to deal with the agreement. We're going to deal with covenant. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Now we have left the creation model. We have left Adam and Eve. And now we're dealing with uh, Noah. And God is producing, and I'm not, I'm sorry, not producing. God is giving the same instructions that he gave to Adam and Eve. And he's now giving it to Noah. Because why? The earth had burnt. The earth had become corrupt. And man had fallen short. Wherever man falls short, God is going to come back and say, go back to the original plan and do exactly what it is that I command you to do from the beginning. We serve the same God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same consistent God, and he will take us back to his covenant. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth. He's commanded us to walk in authority on every bird of the air and all that move on the earth and all the flesh of the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. The concept and the principle of fishing leads me to tell you, all of us here today, look at Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20. 
The word of God tells us to go fishing. Same thing that he's doing here. And what he has also said is that I have given them to you in your hand. Every moving thing that lives should be food for you. I've given you all things, even as the green herbs. Then we jump down to verse 7. He says, and as for you, be fruitful and multiply. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. I take the word of God very literally. When God says be fruitful and multiply, I have to examine my life. And I encourage you to examine your life also. The areas of fruitfulness are not always tied to you having a bunch of children. But to the end, wherever God has planted you, he that is planted by the rivers of water shall do what? Bring forth fruit in his season. I decree and declare that your season is now. My season is now. Our collective is the time has come for the church to rise up. I just heard on last evening that the murder rate in the city of Washington, D.C. has gone way above what is acceptable even. To think that one lost life is even acceptable. And now the city government is looking for answers. They've been looking for answers for a very long time. But now they're throwing their hands up and saying, we don't know what to do. Where is the church? The time has come for you and I to enter into the agreement or put the agreement that God has given to us on display. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. The time has come. The time is being afforded for us for the world to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They need to know about this agreement and they need to know that they too can produce and they too can enter into an agreement with God and God in agreement with them. The terms of the, of the contract that God has established is called righteousness. The terms of the agreement is called sacrifice. It's turn, the terms of the agreement, it means turning your plate down and giving your life over to the Lord. Those are the terms of the agreement before we can even enter and consider multiplication at an individual level. But the kingdom of God must expand. The kingdom of darkness is also expanding. But the children of light must lead those that are in darkness to this light. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. God is letting Noah know that the agreement that we have here will transcend generations. That's how it is. Having accepted Jesus Christ. We now position our children to receive the manifold blessings and their children and their children, children. And we should teach it to them in such a way that they too will pass it on to the generations to come. That is the principle of multiplication, even in the confines of the family. How much more should we look to expand the family? Verse 10, it says, and with every... With every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that you go out of the ark, every beast on the earth, multiply, be fruitful. Thus, I establish my covenant with you. My covenant is established. Now, let's look at some of the terms of this new covenant and there is going to be a newer covenant even greater than this one it says never again shall all the flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth so when we see the floods coming and all the chaos is going on around the world, I'm going to go back to the scriptures and I'm going to stand firmly on the word of God where God says never 
So I'm not going to run around and be scared. I'm going to stand firm and I'm going to move forward in the principles of the terms of the agreement that was established to Noah and with Noah and as a seed of Noah and as a seed of Abraham even today. And God says, this is the sign of the covenant which I will make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Oh, I get excited about this. It says, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant before, between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. Verse 15 says, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Saints of God, those of you that are living on the flood of plains and are concerned about the water rising and global warming, I am not discrediting or discounting the fact that there is going to be an elevated level of the water. But I'm going to stand on the word of God that says, even if the water rise, that means God is going to raise me up. When perils and troubles come and it seem that they come in as a flood, the word of God will establish, like I said before, a new standard by which you and I would exist. That is the covenant that God has produced in the earth. He says, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Verse 15, the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. He didn't say that it wasn't going to become a flood, but it will never become a flood to destroy all flesh. I stand firm on the word of God. If I can believe salvation and I can believe God for salvation, I can believe that he will hold true to his promises even today. He says the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Saints, friends, we serve a multifaceted God. While he is to be revered, he is a kind and gentle God. He's a thoughtful God. He's an expressive God. He's a loving God. He's, he's, he's a kind God. He loves us. That's why he shed his grace. He placed his grace where? In the earth so that we could be beneficiaries of the salvation um, mandate and the salvation covenant. And the covenant that he has made with mankind is that we will spend our eternity with him. How much more should we want to serve a God like this? We should want to be pleasing. Every step of our, our journey should be pleasing to God. My heart's desire today, as we come to a pause, that you will embrace these words that are written in the book of life, in the covenant. We look today at the various references to the book of the covenant. When later on, we will see how Moses administers the covenant that was made between God and man. It is my prayer, it is my desire today that all of us here will enter in to the revelation knowledge of what it means to walk into a position of fruitfulness and multiplication. May God so richly bless you is my prayer until the next time we see each other. We love you with the love of the Lord.